Hello, I'm Grim Window. Welcome back to Washer Dryer's Adventures in Mad Monster Mansion Part 2, also known as the second part of Washer Dryer's Adventures in Mad Monster Mansion. It has thus far been a rather successful romp through the mansion's grounds, and we are currently to get nice and specific in the grounds of the graveyard of the church of Mad Monster Mansion. Because it's not enough to have a big backyard, and it's not even good enough to have a big backyard with your own personal church, but that church also needs a pretty sizable graveyard. I mean, most of you have probably played Cluedo or read Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None, or seen any of the very many parodies of that story, so you'd likely be aware that if a mansion is stately enough, there will be within it plenty of murders, and Mad Monster Mansion is pretty darn stately. Further, it stands to reason that if your house is full of murders, you're going to want a graveyard because murders mean corpses, and corpses when left above ground are known to get rather stinky. No one wants a stinky mansion, it just ruins the vibe of all those high teas and elegant dinners, and so you're going to want a place to put those corpses, which means, ipso facto, you're going to want yourself a graveyard. But I digress. Having collected the unfortunately unavoidable mumbo jumbo token, I climb my way to the top of the tower with the rapid speed of Quasimoto having spotted the rope of the bell of Notre Dame. Though unfortunately, shortly afterwards, I slipped and fell from the clock tower, not unlike Quasimoto, rushing to go to the bathroom and sadly neglecting the cleaner side that warns that the tiles of the bathroom are slippery when wet. They left that part out of the story because it wasn't essential to the plot, but I assure you, it did in fact happen. But rather fortunately, much like tub thumping, when I get knocked down, I get back up again, and so once more, with the speed of King Kong gripping Fei Rei in his hands, climbing up the Empire State Building, I make my second and hopefully far more successful attempt to climb the clock tower, as at this point I'm starting to run out of similes. And so while fresh out of similes, I find myself in the balcony, collecting the last music notes and preparing to make for the summit, which is, unlike climbing Mount Everest, not such a difficult task as there is a helpfully placed spring pad. And having sprung into action, scaled a pole and done an effortlessly executed backflip, we've managed to secure for ourselves the third Jiggy in Mad Monster Mansion. But for us, the award does not end with the Jiggy, as we're also given this beautiful view. The grounds of Mad Monster Mansion are truly a picturesque depiction of cartoon spookums that invoke for me such wonderful toony horrors such as Scooby-Doo. But while we keep the mystery in gang in our hearts, let's move on to a slightly less child-friendly horror trope and make like we have The Shining as we move into the hedge maze. What makes mazes so scary, you might wonder? Well, I don't know. Ever since the labyrinth that Theseus encountered, as we talked about in Gobby's Valley, there's been a pretty big fear as far as humanity goes when it comes to mazes, and you continue to see it crop up in films like Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire and Maze Runner, probably, I don't know, I've not seen it. One might suggest that it's because you're in an enclosed space with nowhere to really go aside from forward or backwards, and though you're leading the way, you still don't really have the choice of what direction to go. Others may well chime in and say that it's the fear of the unknown. You simply can't see what's around the corner and so you never really know what to expect. And further, if you lose your way going through a maze, chances are you've also lost a way out. The entrance of a maze is somewhat a threshold that once passing, you acknowledge that there's a very real possibility that you've already gone past the point of no return. Or perhaps it's the sadistic nature of man that we fear. These mazes that we're going through were physically created entirely on purpose by someone who set out with their primary goal to deceive us. While all of these are distinct possibilities, for me personally, it's because hedge mazes are made of hedges, and hedges are made of plants, and on and within plants are where bugs live, and bugs are rather icky. I mean, they're not great creatures, let's be honest, when you say something's bugging you, it's never a good thing. And so, keeping the icky nature of bugs in mind, you're probably not surprised to hear that I'm not exactly disappointed to be now leaving the hedge maze. And while I am indeed leaving the hedge maze behind me, I feel I should probably mention, though you have seen, what I actually acquired while in there. So, firstly, a lot of music notes, I didn't bother counting how many, and also another Jinjo, which is good because it brings us closer to having all the Jinjos we need in order to get a Jiggy. But enough looking behind us, it's now time to look to the future. And what does the future hold for us? Well, a gross green pond with a big old vine sticking out of it, flapping around just out of the water as if it were the arm of the Lady of the Lake from Arthurian legend. And while there is, quite unfortunately, no Excalibur waiting for us, there is a blue Jinjo, which is possibly just as good, if not better. I mean, after all, the washer dryer doesn't have hands, so a mythical sword wouldn't really help our quest that much, but a Jinjo does bring us one step closer to having another Jiggy. 
Following this, and following a brief look around to get our bearings, it's time to begin yet another time trial challenge, which means once more we're going to draw on the brilliant advice of Meme Formula, who has taught us how to get through this problem. For those of you who missed the previous episodes and don't know what I'm talking about, and don't know what I'm doing, firstly, don't worry about having missed them, we TiVo them so you can get to them later, and secondly, one of the issues that has cropped up while doing this washer dryer challenge is that, much like the problem with holding Loft Excalibur, the washer dryer has no feet, and so therefore, runs into great difficulty when it comes to wearing sneakers. This is of course a problem as the sneakers make you run fast, and if you can't run fast, you have some troubles when trying to do time trial challenges that specifically require you to be wearing them. Luckily however, the user meme formula gave us the spectacular solution of spamming the pause button, which, as you've just seen now, works like a charm. So, once again, thanks for that advice, it's saved our bacon once more. And our prize for so successfully winning the race is we get to go to a dusty old church full of cobwebs and ghosts. Which, you know, I think everyone can agree is even better than a gold medal. And having quickly rushed down the aisle like a blushing bride on her wedding day, it's time to climb up on the pedals of this here gigantic musical instrument, which is not only far more difficult than it looks, but also far more difficult than it should be, because I remind you, the hit detection for this here washer dryer is not that great. An issue compounded even further by the fact that I'm not that great at video games, kind of a double jeopardy there. And once up on the large chair, having very carefully tried to avoid the mumbo jumbo token which is once more strategically placed just to annoy me, it's time to meet the cleverly named Moat's Hand. There are many, many ghosts in this church, but Moat's Hand is hands down the best of them all. Th that's a pun as well I could write for rare. The challenge that Moat's Hand presents is rather simple. In fact, I could probably do it with both hands tied behind my back, which is a good thing because the washer dryer has none. It's basically just Dance Dance Revolution or Guitar Hero with absolutely no skill or reflexes required. Mozart just slowly, one key at a time, plays the organ solo from Inagata de Vida, and we copy him slowly, one key at a time. It's more of a test of patience than anything else. There's no memory aspect to it because you just follow it around and click the button, and there's no reflex aspect to it because he just moves so slowly. I mean, heck. There's not even a musical aspect to it because he moves so slowly that there's no tune. I know I said that we're playing in a garden of Vida, but I don't know that we actually are. I had the TV muted at this point and I was just blasting Iron Butterfly, so I assume that's what was going on. However, once the challenge is finally finished, after what feels like 17 minutes and 5 seconds, Mozart congratulates us for having the ability to play a Hammond organ of a student who's just finished their very first lesson of playing Hammond organs. And a Jiggy is awarded to be later collected, which not only brings an end to the challenge, but also to this episode. And so as always, thanks for watching, and until next time, I have been and still am Grim Grindle.